everybody. Thank you for coming out to the Bexley Public Library tonight. My name is Zach Parrish. I'm the programming librarian here at the library. Tonight, we are very thankful to have a couple professors from the Department of History at The Ohio State University. Uh, we have Theodore Dragostanova, who is a professor of history at The Ohio State University. Her focus is on nationalism, migration, global history, and Cold War culture. Geographically, her research is focused on Eastern Europe uh, with an emphasis on the Balkans and Bulgaria, but she also engages with comparative perspectives on modern Europe and a global perspective. She is also the author of uh, the books, The Cold War from the Margins, uh, which was published in uh, 2021, and Between the Two Motherlands, which was published in 2011. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Robin E. Judd, who is a specialist in Jewish transnational and gender history with a particular interest in Holocaust studies, the history of anti-Semitism, the history of religion, the history of leadership, and the history of migration. She is the author of Contested Rituals, Circumcision, Kosher Butchering, and German German Jewish Political Life in Germany from 1843 to 1933. And uh, she's also the author of the forthcoming book, Love, Liberation, and Loss, Jewish Military Marriages and Community Building After the Holocaust, uh, which is forthcoming from University of North Carolina Press. Um, in recognition of Robin's work in Holocaust studies, Governor DeWine appointed her to Ohio's Holocaust and Genocide Memorial and Education Commission in 2021. Um, we're also thankful to have Robin back uh, in a few weeks. Uh, we have an event with Elizabeth Petikowski, uh, which is on Thursday, December 8th. It'll be at 7 p.m. Uh, Elizabeth has a memoir that is entitled Where From and Where To, and it's one of the last self-told German Jewish stories. Um, so that'll be here on December 8th, and Robin will be moderating the uh, discussion. And lastly, we're also thankful to have Juma Akaria with us tonight. Uh, Juma works for Community Refugee and Immigration Services, uh, also known as CRIS, um, and he works with Refugee Resettlement Case Management and Refugee Youth Mentoring. Um, and he's a Master of Social Work and current PhD candidate at OSU. So we're happy to have Juma here to give us some of the local perspective on what refugee resettlement looks like around Columbus and uh, how we might be able to get involved. Um, so I will turn it over to our presenters for uh, tonight's program on the refugee crisis and context. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Uh, so what we are planning um, on doing here is, first of all, to make sure this is clear, we are not, we, Robin and I, are not going to be talking about current issues necessarily. As historians, we are going to uh, remain rooted in history and we're going to try and clarify processes and terminology based on what we have learned through our archival and historical work. Uh, we began this conversation together with Zach and uh, with Nikar as a conversation um, related to the situation in Ukraine, but I wanted to make very clear that because I'm not a specialist in Ukraine, but also because the situation on the ground was changing very quickly, I was not comfortable speaking about that particular situation in any certain so I do want to um, give you these figures here. This is the most recent figures as of the 2nd of November. Uh, and the numbers are really terrifying, considering that this is a country of 43 million people. You can see uh, the vast number of both refugees and internally displaced persons uh, in Ukraine and out of Ukraine. And uh, obviously, you have probably heard that in the media, uh, this is referred to as the greatest refugee crisis that Europe has faced since World War II. So what Robin and I uh, will try to do is put a statement in context and actually think about other moments in European history where refugee crises have been perceived as uh, such. 
Now, we also want to keep this global perspective in mind. Uh, so in addition to the Ukrainian situation, just wanted to throw out these uh, numbers uh, here. So uh, the uh, global um, refugee problem is not just a Euro European problem. And in fact, as you can see, is that um, if you take into consideration the Ukrainian numbers, in fact, most of the displaced persons worldwide are obviously not in Europe. And if we drill down a little bit, this is not uh, very uh, clear, probably from a distance, you cannot uh, quite make all of these um, numbers. Uh, but uh, this is uh, from the Pew Research Center, uh, and they try to put in context the largest refugee movements globally. And it's a very interesting table because it shows both um, uh, basically by number and share of the population. Uh, you can see, for example, refugees out of Afghanistan, I mean, constitute staggering 50% of the population in the 1990s. 50% of the population, you know, in situation of being uh, uh, displaced as refugees, right? And then uh, you see here some other cases, for example, I, I as a, um, uh, a scholar of Eastern Europe, uh, and I'm going to talk about this very quickly, looking at the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, what you can see there is a, um, basically a quarter of the population of Yugoslavia uh, was on the move uh, during the war. And by the way, at that point, that was referred to as the um, greatest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. So um, that was now uh, some 25 years ago, uh, but we often have short memory when it comes to this crisis. So I just want to remind us that that was very much the situation in Europe in the 90s. And uh, you can also just a, a quick reminder that during the Yugoslav uh, wars, uh, I mean, the displacement of both refugees and internally displaced persons uh, was massive, but also we saw this whole range of um, actions that we continue thinking through today, from the shelling of villages and cities, to uh, basically snipers that are um, targeting civilian populations, to the forced um, migration of uh, people, to ethnic cleansing and genocide. And what you see the picture on the top left is the monument, uh, the I mean, the burial site in Srebrenica, uh, where some 8,000 uh, Bosniak boys and men were massacred by Serbian paramilitaries. In other words, this is just a reminder that war, um, unfortunately, has been to Europe since World War II. But of course, the urgency of the situation in Ukraine today is really making us refocus uh, on uh, some of these issues. And what I want to do is go back in history, a century back in history, and actually talk about the origins of the refugee question as such in the context of European history. And, and I can go further back, but I think that for the sake of brevity, it makes sense for us to start really with the Great War, with World War I, uh, which in the continent uh, for uh, four disastrous uh, years. Uh, very often, uh, we tend to read and watch films about what is happening on the Western Front. Of course, now we have the new remake of All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, we have seen plenty uh, of uh, films uh, related to the Western Front where the situation was of standstill and trenches. But in fact, what happened uh, uh, in the Great War, the most of the refugees during this time period occurred on the Eastern Front. And if you uh, just notice here this area between basically Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Russia, those various lines that you think in the arrows, the front changed multiple times there during the course of these four years. And as the front lines changed, so did the flows of populations. And in this context, what we're seeing is a variety of different population moves, which often historians describe as radical population politics, which can only happen under conditions of war. And I have put these varieties uh, of term, terms used 
uh, to describe these various population movements on the slide because we still continue debating the exact meaning of all of these terms. And what I'm seeing in the media today is a lot of actually confusion. What constitutes evacuation? What constitutes deportation? What constitutes internment, right? And even in the contemporary situation in Kherson, when we're talking about the evacuation of people, right? we did see that the Russians evacuated civilian populations as the military was also uh, you know, evacuating, but there were clearly also some coerced evacuations within this course. Uh, this case, we can actually probably talk about deportations and internments and so forth and so forth, right? So, I mean, we really need to think about the meaning of all these various terms. Uh, and um, also during this time period with the Great War, because this was considered to be the first modern total war, what we're seeing is that again, the military conflict affected civilian populations disproportionately. So the use of force against civilians became the rule. Uh, and in this, uh, in this context, what you see is this huge refugee waves that were generated as a result of this conflict. Now, in addition to refugee movements, in the context of war, we also had civil wars where people fought against each other. So that happened, for example, in the Polish context. It also happened later on, uh, in the context of the Bolshevik Revolution and its aftermath. So you have additional displacement as a result of civil war. Uh, and then in this context, we see forced migrations, which often generated you know, or degenerated into ethnic cleansing. Uh, and I am happy to brainstorm those terms and define them in the q and I don't want to take time to do this right now. And then obviously we also have during this time period examples of genocide as well. So um, I uh, have some images here just to show you again, like the massive displacement of people from uh, on the left side, you have basically the internment and deportation of populations and their respective uh, you know, belongings. What happened during this time period is that the railway station became a main hub of refugee uh, activity. We also see the emergence of the refugee camp as an institution, some of them more makeshift than others. You can see on the top of very makeshift, you know, tent refugee camp in the 1920s. And then you see on the bottom actually an internment camp in Great Britain. And then you see people moving with their belongings in any conceivable way possible from trains to carts uh, in the mud uh, and so forth. Uh, but it is in this context, especially on the Eastern Front, that one historian actually described the situation on the Eastern Front between Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Germany as a whole empire walking, that being the Russian empire, uh, and that Russian empire at the time also included what today is Ukraine. And in fact, if you look at this map, with the, uh, those lines that you're seeing there, this is pretty much the territory of Ukraine where this massive displacement of people occurred. Somewhere between 10 and 12 million people were on the move during this time period. And of course, it's a conservative um, uh, figures that historians have been able to verify. We really don't know the entire scale of the, uh, of, the, of the problem during this time period. But what I'm trying to say here is that we have some comparable refugee uh, waves back in history, unfortunately, in this same time period, in this same area. And that is something, you know, to keep in mind this historical memory of these prior refugee movements also color how people perceive these experiences uh, today. So quickly, because I don't want to take up all the time here. I mean, this is the time where under the cover of war, Ottomans per, uh, perpetrate the Armenian genocide, which is widely considered to be the first case of modern genocide in Europe. There were prior genocides uh, in the German Empire, for example. But, uh, you know, and of course, here we can actually debate what is Europe, uh, because this is occurring in the Ottoman Empire. But nevertheless, between 750 and 1.2 million people were, um, you know, targeted uh, and died either by force or or starvation as they were marching through the Syria, Syrian desert. So um, we're, again, something that can only happen under the cover of war. Uh, and then in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War, what we're also seeing is the flight of white Russians, uh, which uh, um, 
um, uh, Koi, so the flight of the right uh, 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 Russians arrived after the technical end of World War One, right? I mean, the war actually ended in 1918, but then the flight of the right uh, uh, Russians accelerated in the aftermath of the end of the war. So this sort of like prolonged the war in these territories. And this uh, was disturbing for, uh, uh, you know, Western governments for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, in the end, what this flight of the white regions did is that it generated a lot of public attention, which led, among other things, to the establishment of the first High Commission for Refugees in 1920 under the leadership of Friedrich Nansen and under the jurisdiction of the League of Nations, this international organization that was created in the aftermath of the war to handle war and peace issues uh, and uh, so forth. At first, the High Commission for Refugees was only focused on white Russians. Later on, it also expanded to include the uh, uh, Armenians. And under the pre purview of that organization, what we actually have right now for the first time is the recognition that statelessness is a problem. It requires international attention. And there are international organizations that actually will be handling that. That organization was the League of Nations. Various schemes were um, uh, experimented to, uh, with. The most famous one is the Nansen passport, which was created to allow people who were stateless uh, to actually be able to exist because after World War I, passports basically became mandatory. They were very random in the previous time period, but it was really during World War I and after the war that you could not really function without identification papers anymore. That became increasingly more so in the 1930s. That might become clear a little bit later on. Uh, but what is specific to the definition of refugees that emerged during this time period is that per the de definitions of the League of Nations, you only were a refugee if you belong to certain national groups. In other words, refugee status was assigned to people based on their nationality. Uh, so you are a refugee if you are an Armenian, you are a refugee if you're a white Russian. Uh, you have to belong to one of those groups to be considered refugee. And that is a different category than what we uh, use uh, uh, today. Um, and because I really uh, I might be, um, going too um, too much here i just want to say that uh even though again the war ended in 1918 um what uh, ultimately happened is that conflict spilled over even in the aftermath of the war in the early 1920s uh there was more conflict between greece and turkey which led I'm going to just do this very quickly to the institution of uh, an innovation in the handling of people. And that was the innovation of compulsory population exchange. Instituted uh, uh, almost 100 years ago, actually there will be a lot of academic conferences next year um, to debate what is the meaning of this population exchange. The Lausanne Treaty of 1923 instituted a compulsory population exchange between Greece and Turkey using the criterion of religion. Under the purview of that uh, treaty, all Muslims in Greece were Greek or Christians in, in Turkey, in what became Tur Turkey. The criterion was religion. There were very few exceptions and some 2 million people were exchanged under the provisions of these uh, treaties. And last um, slide here, uh, that uh, treaty was interpreted as a success. It was interpreted as a success because the logic was that it had ended conflict, that it had prevented further massacres, that it had stopped war from expanding uh, you know, to other populations. Uh, but ultimately, what that population exchange also did is that it made forced migration into a legitimate rule uh, for the use of the international community, where you know the international community could decide that some people are going to be exchanged on some criterion and people have no choices. So that's also often described as basically internationally sanctioned ethnic cleansing that occurred as a, uh, as a you know, result uh, of this population exchange. So the big question here is, uh, I mean, um, should population exchange be used as a legitimate tool of territories in the aftermath of the war? And that's something that 
it's not really debated up until today because there are other precedents later on, but at that that would be question. And I will hand it over, colleague and friend, Robin, to continue um, with the 1930s. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna pick up with the story of the refugee crisis in context in the 1930s. And one of the things that I hope is really evident just in that this first image is that we're increasingly thinking about a story of um, different populations going and moving to different places, but also thinking about generation. Um, and one of the questions that um, gets talked about a lot in the interwar period and gets really emphasized in the 1930s and 1940s is a question of generation. What do we do about children? How do we understand the placement of children? Should children be under the same category of refugees? Do they need certain kinds of care? Does trauma affect children differently? And so um, as we sort of talk today in the brief, whatever 10, 15 minutes I have, um, we'll see some images of children. And some of that has to do with the fact that we are gonna have tens of millions of children. And, and the definition of children at this time is essentially anyone under the age of 18 um, was considered a child uh, by the international organizations who dealt with refugees. Um, but we're gonna see lots of them um, in movement. Let's see, there we go. Um, so uh, Teodora left us in the 1930s with this refugee crisis. Here we have a group of boys, and I should acknowledge that all of the images that I'm uh, using today come from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, their experiencing history site. Um, so certainly one of the things that we're seeing in the 1930s that's going to prompt a lot of conversation about sort of the rethinking of the refugee, right? Of, of expanding that definition of individuals who come from certain spaces. Um, our first, a series of global crises, including a crisis of citizenship, where a number of nations turn on their own citizens and strip them of their citizenship. So of course, given that I am mostly a German historian or often think of myself as a German historian, right? Um, we think about the 1935 Nuremberg Laws that set out what is a German citizen and who is not, but Germany is not the only place where we have the stripping of citizenship. We also see some major changes in terms of the process of migration and movement in the 1930s. So um, we see the further establishment of quotas that had begun in the early 1900s, first in England in 1905 and 1907, um, but then in the US in 1923, Canada in 1927. Um, we have the establishment of flight taxes across the world. Um, this was something that really begins in the 18th century, be becomes sort of much more standard in the late 19th century. And by this point becomes pretty standard. If you're going to leave somewhere, you actually have to pay the place you leave. Um, we have a series of papers that Theodora alluded to, um, where one doesn't not just need one's passport, but one also needs a visa and possibly also a transit visa. And that's actually a major issue with children's migration in this time. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not children should be exempt from the transit visa status because the assumption was a child wouldn't stay in the place of transit. The child would, of course, keep on going. We actually know that that's not the case. Um, we have lots of children in Lisbon and there's a creation of a, a ser series of orphanages there. Um, and in the 1930s, we have this radical shift in the bureaucracies. So the consular system had existed actually since the early modern period, but it's in the 1930s that we have this sort of solidified sense establishment of consular offices that are overseeing migration. Um, the Nansen office that Theodora was referring to before um, takes on sort of a new role and expands its oversight of refugees. Um, and we have a commission that is part Nansen, part not, and that's the High Commission for Refugees coming from Germany. So. In 1933, with Hitler's rise to power, we have a separate office 
that's separate from Nansen that's going to deal with Jews. And, and in 1939, this will change back. So just because I have to say, right, when we dive down and we look at these refugee populations, we often see things that we don't necessarily expect, right? So um, in 1933, for example, that sort of narrative of Jews not leaving is actually not true, right? About 38,000 of them leave. Um, but then about 10,000 of them come back. Um, and they come back in 1934 and 1935. Why? Because they go to places like Poland or Romania or Czechoslovakia and unless or France. And unless they're really middle class, it's going to be hard to settle. There's going to be a decrease in immigration, right? People come back and they say, you know what? Hitler's Germany isn't so great, but Poland, you know, Poland's awful. Um, and so we stop seeing as much immigration. But then with that revocation of citizenship, the numbers increase again in 1935. And then in 1938, with Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, which was just last week, I had to remember which day it, it is now, um, the numbers go up again. And when those numbers go up, we begin to see a refugee crisis in Europe that doesn't just include Jews, but includes a large number of other groups as well. And what we have here is the image from the New York Times from July of 1938 um, that uh, sort of indicates, of course, the um, Evian conference of that summer, kind of sparked by Roosevelt and creates the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees. That's the moment that the Dominican Republic opens up its doors. Allegedly, it was the only country that did. We now know that that's not exactly true, but it, it makes for a better story. Um, in November of 1938, right, we have the Night of the Broken Glass. Um, the St. Louis, May of 1939, sort of the most famous case of a ship without harbor, but not the only case, um, probably the best sort of publicized case. This is the case of a, a ship that leaves Hamburg and then goes uh, from place to place to place, and it is a ship without harbor. Um, it is rejected by Cuba, by the US, by Canada, and eventually it goes back to, um, to Europe where there is a negotiation. Some of the Jews have to return to Germany some of them return, have to go to France or are accepted by France. Some of them go to England, and it's really only those in England who are guaranteed safety. The White Paper of May 1939, so Palestine at this point is a British mandate, um, and Britain in May of 1939 clamps down on immigration. So we're going to see in this moment of 38-39 a lot of talk about immigration, um, so much so that that Nansen office and that separate office come together to create the office of the High Commissioner for all refugees under League of Nation Protection. And that's itself kind of quite a name. And then, of course, we have this narrative of World War II that begins in September of 1939 with a whole series of new forced migrations, forced displacements, um, murder and genocide. Um, so if we just were to look at the Germany number, by the way, it's about 36,000 in 1938 and 77,000 in 39, lots of Jews leave Germany. Um, but where are all of these refugees across parts of Europe going to? They're going a lot of places, right? They're going elsewhere in Europe. By 1939, it's basically France in terms of Western Europe. That's the only country that's not insisting on visas and passports. So a lot of people go to France. A lot of Roma Sinti, a lot of Jews. The US, Palestine, Britain, if they can get in, Central and South America, and Shanghai. Um, and that's, of course, is and this, these are images from the Dominican Republic. We've got a series of schemes, that's what they were called. So um, where, and this should sound familiar to some of you, right, where international organizations or national organizations come together find some philanthropists, raise money, and think, OK, how can we figure out a way to bring x number of Jews? Right. So we have, I just mentioned five here, but there are dozens of these so-called schemes in the 30s and early 40s. Right. There are the so-called transfer agreements. You, we will give you money. You give us people. Um, we have the a settlement in the Dominican Republic of a Sasua. That's here. 
the kinder transport, children going to Britain, Bricha, the illegal immigration to Palestine, and the War Refugee Board, which gets created in 1943, that essentially creates false passports and papers for people and smuggles them into Italy and other places. There are sort of two phases, and I'll just end really um, with the, the second phase. Here we have a group of children in Italy. Um, these are uh, mostly children. Some of them are from Bulgaria and Yugoslavia um, and Greece. So we have in 1943, and you'll see these dates here because I'm really pushing us to think about the end of war differently, not to just use 1945, because when we think about migration policy at the end of war, we have to think about the migration policies that get established as the war is ending. So even though the war in Europe doesn't end until 45, right? For the folks in Bari, Italy, the war ends in 1943. So UNRWA, right, in 1943 gets created. Um, this is the Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. And it's going to do things like repatriate and assist, and this is the kicker here, refugees and displaced persons. Because one of the key things that happens in this period is that we have the creation of this category of displaced persons that's different than refugees. Um, and so the refugee kind of a little bit closer to a definition maybe that we might be understand today, those who flee their homelands but can't go back, right? DPs, those who are uprooted by war but who are expected to return. And of course, it's not what the individual himself, herself, themselves desires. It's what the oversight organizations think. So the oversight organizations imagine Jews as example, for example, as DPs. Um, in about 1947, there are 210,000 Jewish DPs and 175,000 Jewish DPs in Germany, but there are 40 million DPs um, in Europe at this time. This is a huge population. And so of course they think that they all wanna go back because nobody wants to imagine them all coming right to the United States. Um, so in 1947, when UNRWA runs out of money, we have the creation of the IRO, the International Refugee Organization. At this point, it's gonna inherit about 643,000 cases of individuals that are refusing to go back. Um, we have the Displaced Persons Act in the United States in 1943, really important in terms of our own history of migration. It's a very narrow definition. Only those who are in the allied zones, only those who are in the DP camps at the end of the war and six months afterwards. In 1948, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is going to be essential in how we think about refugee policy. We also have the definition of genocide, same, right? It's We're going to begin to see genocide being a sort of key to the definition. And we're gonna have that expansion of that DP Act in 1950, broadens the definition. And then in 1951, we'll have the Refugee Convention. And this is what will begin sort of the process of expanding that definition again. I'll hand the floor over. My name is Juma Acha. Thank you, Jack, for the intro. And I'm so blessed to be with these wonderful professors here. I'm a mini small child in front of them. I don't have a lot of experience, but I have experience of being a refugee. I'm a former refugee from Bhutan. Bhutan is a very small country in between China and Tibet, sorry, China and India. It was once upon a, call, once upon a time called as no man's land because it was never claimed by either of this country. It was a buffer zone between the then India and Tibet. Later after this Tibetan, when they were fleeing China, Tibet, they occupied this land and called their territory. And I am an inhabitant of that, that country. So literally, I my country of origin was a Norman's land once upon a time. But then I was evicted in early 90s uh, due to the ethnic cleansing policy of the government of Bhutan. And then I became refugee when I was 14 years old. I lived for 20 years in refugee camp in Nepal. And then through the auspice of UN Refugee Resettlement Program, I had that golden opportunity of coming to this wonderful country as a refugee and I'm here 10 years old. So I'm a child, that is why in that concept, I'm still saying, although I'm 40 years old, I'm still a small child here. 
So I don't have that much of historical knowledge, but thank you professors for refreshing my history class lectures back in my early childhood. But in that was a European history though. So a little bit background about myself is I work for a refugee resettlement program. That's how the word refugee, I like to keep it there as a backdrop of my screen. Uh, I might talk a lot about uh, these things throughout. So I work for CRIS, Community Refugee and Immigration Service, which is one of the refugee resettlement agency here in central Ohio. And we have resettled uh, more than 9,000 refugees over time. And it started as a small organization, but now we are one of the big organizations in central Ohio resettling refugees. We do a lot of extended service after resettlement period. We'll talk about that. But I just want to go quickly through the slides. My sli I have very comprehensive slide, but then I won't go to that. I don't want to bore you all. So I think we have this context at the beginning of the slide when uh, Professor was explaining about that. So I would like to go specifically with the refugee population. So now there's so many, the world ha has, the current crisis of refugee is one of the world craziest crises occurring. Before even Ukrainian things happened, before even Afghan thing happened, I think that was, the, all, we are already having the world craziest crisis of refugees. There are a lot of people being displaced, more than 80, 83 billion, million people were being displaced. And out of all these, if you see the last part of it, like there's a very small percentage of people who are considered as refugees. There are so many internationally displaced people. And out of that large chunk, there's a very small percentage who are called refugees by, who are entitled as a refugee title. And I would not consider myself as lucky to be a refugee, but I think there is a advantage and disadvantage on that. And out of all those, only one percentage of them get this third country resettlement. So I want to jump into that, what that third country resettlement is. So professor left with the definition of refugee. So I want to go there and refugee is a person outside the country of his or her nationality who is unable or unwilling to return to the country because of the well-founded fear of persecution based on his or her race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or a political opinion. So that is what refugees, that was I am. I, I fall under one of those categories. Then, so this is how refugee journey begins. My journey personally, if I have to correlate with that. So country of origin is a country where you are born and raised. I was born in Bhutan, raised for, for early part of my life. Then I fled the country. I was forcefully evicted. I would not say that I left the country. I was forcefully evicted from the country. Then after that, refugee will then go and leave to a country of asylum. So that could be a third country, a fourth country, fifth country, a second country. It can be, you can move from one place to another. Like we can see Ukrainian now are moving from Ukraine to Poland, Poland to Bulgaria, and like they're all moving around those corridors. So then country of asylum where they take asylum and where UN will recognize them as refugee and then register them under that refugee umbrella. And they will live under the supervision of UNSCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee. The history of that came to that. I never knew about that, but that was a good refreshment for me. And then after that, being living in that uh, country of asylum, if they are accepted as refugee for third country resettlement, then they will process from there and will come to the country of resettlement. So for me, Bhutan is my country of origin. Nepal is my country of asylum, where I live for 20 years as refugee. And then country of resettlement is the United States where I am today. So refugee resettlement in Central Ohio is one of well-known program in Central Ohio, specifically because we receive a lot of refugees and Columbus has been one of the uh, most welcoming city in Ohio. So resettlement happens here through different process. So the, there are different ways our refugees are being resettled. We have nine national voluntary organizations that partnership with the uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement and Health and Human Service Department, DHS. And through their channel, there is a local office for this national VOLAX, voluntary organization. And we are one of the local offices of Church World Service. All these national uh, offices are religious, faith-based for some reason. They're all, they all have, they are all tied with religion. And then they have their local offices in 49 states, except Hawaii, every state has a refugee resettlement program through some of these national partners. So it's a selection and transfer refugee from a country in which they have short protection to the third country. So this is what they call third country resettlement. I just want to provide a brief preview of what third country resettlement is. 
For refugee program to be settled, uh, I mean solved, there are three steps. The first one is what they call repartition. Repartition is only possible if the host country and the country of origin are willing to barter, will be willing to exchange people. So if Bhutan was willing to take me back home, I would have been repartied to Bhutan. But for our, at, in our situation, Bhutan was not willing to consider us under that. And next is what they call local, inter, local integration, means the host country will accept them as their citizen and they can get integrated to that country. And if both of these options are not available, these people will remain as refugees in that country. It can be forever, it can be for a short period of time. So if any of the Western countries, advanced, like developed countries are willing to take them, like United States, Canada, Australia, the many other countries are taking, then that option is only available for refugees. That is the only option, there is no choice. You cannot choose to go to United States, Canada, Denmark. It's whatever comes, whatever is thrown to you, do you accept it? If you want to take it, then grab the bag and run to the airport. So who determines the number of refugees? It may be a little political here, but I just want to bring it to you because this is a common theme that we hear about every day. Who determines how many refugees will be admitted to the United States? It is the president. It is the, pres the president of the United States of America has that a veto power to determine how many refugees he or she can admit to the country. Normally it has to go with the advice of Congress, but some administration, they don't follow that pathway. They have their own, yes, no, 10,500 or no refugees, no Muslim, things like that. So it depends upon who the president is. So our four, like six years ago, we had a very unfortunate situation where refugees were totally banned. So we have a situation where no refugees were coming. But favorably, things change over time. I know as the landscape, political landscape of the country changes, I think these things are changing. Top 10 states where refugees are coming. So we are also one of that top 10. So it's so fortunate to be Bakai. That's why I moved from Rhode Island to Columbus. I think I made my Columbus a better home. So Texas, although has a lot of anti-immigrant policies, but still there's still a huge number of refugees and a lot of the refugees getting resettled in Texas moved to other states because of the punitive policies that are being developed by the governor. Refugee admission by country and origin. So this was, this is, these are the current, as of now, DRC has a lot of ref, uh, refugees from DRC are coming more. On my caseload also, I have 60% of refugees from Congo. And they come from, uh, Congolese come from Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, uh, all those corridors. Where do refugees come to Columbus? So we have six largest groups in central Ohio. I think this should be very interesting to know. Somali refugees, we have, Columbus is the second largest home for Somali refugees. Uh, Bhutan, uh, my community, we, the largest Bhutanese Nepali community is in central Ohio. We have more than 35,000 Bhutanese Nepali in central Ohio. The Democratic Republic of Congo is another big group and is a growing, now is exponentially growing because in 2022 only, we resettled around 362 Congolese, which means like just through us, there is another agency that also helped refugee resettlement. So it is growing every, every month. Burma and Afghanistan. So, so these are the different services we provide at Chris. <clears throat> refugee resettlement is the one of the strong program. And we also have refugee health and wellness program, refugee youth mentorship program. That's what I work for. And especially is like providing mentors to our high school and middle school students so that they get, uh, they can get help through the, uh, and their education, also getting socially adapted to the new place. And older refugee and senior program, we have what we call companion partners, where we provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring to our older senior refugees who are willing to become citizens, who are willing to learn English. We have citizenship program, we have ESL program for adults, family services to help me grow. We have community ties program that provide interpreters for different languages, variety of languages. We have emergency rental assistance program, and we also have legal services and mass grant program. So these are different ways. So these are the different way you can engage if you want to get involved with Chris or other refugee resettlement agency to help refugees in your neighborhood, in your community, to welcome them, to support them. You can be a volunteer. Volunteers can be in the form of tutor, home tutor, can be language partner, can be companion, can be youth mentors, anyway, a welcome team. You can create a group among yourself, from your church, from your community to become welcome team, to welcome families when they're coming. 
It can be an arrival team, which is a supporting team that helps them to go to the appointment, uh, driving them around the city. As a conversation partner, if you want to help them learn English, as a youth mentor, as an intern, as a donor, as a fundraiser, in whatever capacity, if you're willing to do it, there are opportunities there. We have a question from the chat. Um, Theodora mentioned that uh, refugees were originally um, national status. Um, was there any specific act that shifted that to other protected classes or did that uh, the definition of refugee just kind of adapt over time uh, to, to meet the needs of LGBTQ, religious needs and um, other protected groups? I'm, I'm happy to uh, respond to this question, but um, just uh, keeping in mind, you know, where we are with time, I wonder whether we want to collect a few questions and see, just to make sure that if anyone else wants to ask something, we can. Uh, this is actually a question for all three of you about how, how do you stop being a refugee? You've arrived here and, you know, would the, would the, would the status of a refugee follow a person for the rest of her his own life? Or at some point, are you no longer at least legally considered a refugee? And so you, you spoke about the transition from, um, so I wonder if you could each speak about how, how that works, both legally, historically, as well as today. So uh, for refugees, particularly when you are coming through the refugee resettlement program, you have a certain timeline to get away from that title. So when you come first, you are under certain uh, consideration. Refugee come with an I-94 document. So you have, you are a temporary status for a year and they apply for a green card after one year. And after one year, once they apply green card, they, they get approved for 10 years as a permanent residence. But refugee has that opportunity to apply for citizenship in the four, after completing four years. So you can become a citizen by fifth year. That's what I became citizen in 2016. And then no more refugee, I'm done. I'm done with the title forever. But there's a very historical concept for me. I still consider myself as a former refugee. And we also need to say that that varies from country to country. And there is not like, you know, one rule when you stop being a refugee, because typically what happens people, so I know that from the European context, you get a temporary protection status, which often actually gives you protection just for a set number of years. And then you have to reapply. Uh, and then you need to get that status of a refugee. And then that may or may not put you on the path to permanent settlement and permanent you know, residence and then citizenship. It's a long, long process and it just varies from country to country. Now, as far as the definition, there's a lot of discussion today whether we need to change the definition because the definition of who is a refugee is that definition that Robin provided us from, from 1951, uh, which is someone who is fleeing due to fear of persecution, mostly for political reasons, right? War, violence, or political persecution because of race, uh, religion, ethnicity, uh, social status. Uh, I don't know the gender is in the definition. I, I'm not. Okay, so now there's a lot of discussion out there whether we actually need to revise that definition because there are a lot of other scenarios and situations. For example, what do we do with climate refugees? So if you are fleeing a certain area because your area has been made in, uninhabitable because of a crisis, this, uh, you know, climate disaster, you actually are not considered a refugee. So you cannot get all of these protections, even though your area may have been devastated basically as much as you know, a wartime situation. So, and then of course, the whole issue of gender and, you know, sexual identity or, you know, you know, gender identity, sexual persecution and all that, that is not in the actual, um, well, uh, definition. Uh, so uh, it's an outdated definition. So. And so, I mean, Hannah Arendt always gets the last word. Um, and uh, some of you may know, right, Arendt was, uh, herself, right, a refugee, and she has a, uh, an essay that I that I always assign students in my history of migration class. We refugees, right? And one of the things that she argues is that uh, that apparently she writes nobody was to know that contemporary history has created a new kind of human beings 
the kind that are put in concentration camps by their foes and the kind who don't like to be called refugees. Instead, we wanna call each other newcomers or immigrants. But as far as I know, there is not and was never a club such as those. Um, and so I, part of what Arendt really is grappling with is that moment, right, where one gets finally defined, if you will, as a refugee, which gives her tremendous access, right? It allows her to leave Lisbon um, and come to New York. Uh, but as she will argue essentially until her life, one is always a refugee, despite the fact that one never wants to be called a refugee. Adora, Robin, Juma, thank you so much for coming out and getting this historical context and an update of where we are today.